This episode of the podcast is being sponsored by Merchantson. I would also note here that after we finish recording this episode, Rabbi Kilson, uh, remember that he forgot to discuss the 11th drusha, where the Ran talks about Mishpat. So he recorded that separately, and I added it on to the end of the episode. So all the way at the end of the episode, when you hear me say that it's finished, just there's about five minutes more that was added there as well. If anyone would like to uh, sponsor an episode or to support the podcast, or for any questions or comments, please email me, svaramchatter at gmail.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Svarim Chatter podcast. In this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Rabbi Yehuda Kilsen, who is the translator, editor, annotator uh, of the new um, English edition from Arts World of the Drushas Aran, which is the Drushas Discourses of the Ran, Rabbi Nisim ben Ruven of Corona, which, okay, we'll discuss that. Um, it's uh, two volumes. The second volume just recently was published. And uh, we'll be discussing the safe of the work and what they did. So thank you, Rabbi, Rabbi Kielsen, for joining me. Thank you for having me. So let's start off. Tell the listeners about yourself and your background. Uh, so I was, uh, I'm born and bred in uh, Lawrence, New York. I attended the local yeshivas. I went to uh, Yeshiva Dar Chaitara Elementary, Yeshiva Farakoy for high school, uh, and base Medrash. I was in Yeshiva Sharatara for a year. And I spent eight years as a Bachar and Yungaman in Beis Yosef and Flatbush under Rabbi Mordechai Yafin, Rabbi Uncle Drillman. Uh, and that's my pedigree. Okay, so obviously now you now you did this uh, Josh Zaran project where you, you, you wrote the English translation, you wrote, did the notes, and we'll get more into that. So in how, I assume this is not the first region that you're into, obviously into Rishayim, especially Sifrei Amuna. So I mean, how did you get it? How did that happen? How did you get into, into that? So I, if I had to boil it down to a to a two minute answer, let's say, uh, that would give a, an, an anecdote that uh, when I was a teenager, I was davening a mincha in a base oval, and uh, we were in the living room, and there's interesting swarm around and books, and I noticed on the shelf there was a very interesting called uh, books a uh, book of uh, beliefs and opinions from the Yale Judaica series from Rosajagain Samuel Rosenblatt's uh, English translation of the Amunas Fideas, and it looked fascinating. I got myself a copy, I started reading it, and I was uh, blown away. It was just fascinating, and it's so uh, raw, Rav Sajigain, the way he writes. This is, this is particularly about Rav Sajigain, but it's, I, obviously he was the pioneer of this field and many other fields in linguistics and in the diktuk and in, uh, in Parshanot and everything. So anyway, in his Akdama, he talks about, he says how he's writing, he thinks that he can help people. He sees people drowning without, with doubts and not knowing what to believe and what to think. And he's going to do the best he can to help them. And if you see anything that's not written exactly right, then you should fix it. And don't think that it's because it's not your safer, that you can't, you can't uh, have a yacht in it. He says, all I ask from you is that you come in with an open mind and, uh, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll gain from it. And maybe I make some mistakes. It's a study of contrast, actually, between him and, and the way the Rambam writes in his Akdam with Tamar Nebuchim. He says, you know, if you find any mistakes or contradictions, there's a good chance you have no idea what I'm talking about. And I say the opposite. I mean the opposite of what of what you read. But anyway, that's just, the, you know, the different personalities. Um, so that really, I think, opened my mind to these uh, to these types of swarm and they really drew me in. Uh, it's, um, so, and I would also say that you had Rabban Lapiansky on about the uh, Sefer Yisrael the Atera, and what he said really resonated with me. He said how the how the Rishonim are the reality; they they form the bedrock of what is, and then the Achronim help us figure out uh, different Mahalchem, and they could say Pshatim, and they could say all kinds of things. But the Rishonim form the bed, bedrock of what is, and and in, and particularly in Ashkafa, he said he says. As opposed, as opposed to in halacha, when you learn the Gemara and you follow what the Gemara says, you'll get 60% right. You follow Shulchan Aruch, you get 90% right. You, then you can do the Mishabur and Aruch and you get everything exactly right. But in Ashkafa, you can read the Gemara and do what the Gemara says and you're an apikaris. So it's particularly important in the, in the Ashkafa to get what the Rishayim said. And he said it's such a shud that people should learn uh, Ashkafa Pratis ideas from uh, mice about Ramey Simcha. Uh, there's Rishayim. Why don't we learn, learn like a, learn like a mensch? So that's the. Interestingly, I'll point out, going back to when you said the Yale Judaica series with Samuel Rosenblatt, he's Yosef Rosenblatt's son. Mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm. interesting. I don't remember. Right. That. But yeah. And that, uh, that book is still around actually. Still in print. People still get it. 
Um, so, so, okay. So getting back to Drash Saran. So, I mean, what happened with the Drash Saran? Was the Drash Saran another one of the Saran you went through all these Saran or that you decided to do this project or art school approached you? How did that uh, come about? Well, so it's actually, uh, Drash Saran was not something that I had learned before this came about. It's something I always wanted to learn. I had not gotten to it. I actually noticed that Shraga Silverstein had an English edition that was out and that was something that uh, I never really went through it, but I just noticed it and it was something that I was going to get to him at, at some point. I, I hope to get to it. Um, but uh, if you want to explain why something happens, uh, you know, the Rambam says uh, in Milos Hegayin, there's, you know, there's four, there's four kinds of causes. So, you know, like the ninth shah, I think. So, one of the so really it should have four answers this question if you understand exactly what each cause how it works but I, there are two sides to this to to answer this it's from the practical side and then from the uh, what what uh, what we're what we're accomplishing what what we hope to accomplish with the safer from the practical side um, there is the benefactor of this project is someone to whom the works of the classic Rishayim is near and dear to his heart and Drusha Saran is particularly his nearest and dearest to him. And he's looked for years, I think, to find someone to be able to present it in a way that the public could benefit. Um, and uh, somebody contacted me about it and I said, somebody, it said, it said that the funding was going to be covered. And I said, I think really we should do it with Art Scroll. They have the institutional strength to uh, to to finish it and do it in a, in a, in a very Bokavu Dekaifen. So, but I would say uh, from the teleological standpoint, I would say the cause, the reason to do it, what we're accomplishing with it. Um, the run, I didn't know this before I started, but just having gone through it, I could tell you that Emunas Vodeus is not the, the first safer that somebody should be learning in in the in the Rishanim, I think Ashkav's Rishanim. I don't think it's chronological, but it's not. Uh, I don't think that it, that's the best way of going about it. The Ran, I think, is actually a very good. It's a very good place to start because the Rishanim have lexicons and they have assumptions. It, I'm talking about these Rishanim in, in the Machshava of this school. They, it's very hard to jump into Mar Nevuchim and to understand what he's talking about, and even the Kuzari. A lot of the Kuzari is very hard to understand, and Moshe is also certainly. So, and on the other side, to the other extreme, we have the Ramban, which is very, who's very understandable, and the Ramban talks to us in a language we understand. The problem, if we can call it in quotes, it's called the problem with doing the Ramban for this is that much of the Ramban isn't about the Zinyanim; it's about explaining the Psukim, which is which is great, but that's not uh but that that's not accomplishing this goal that we're referring to so there's scattered pieces and the ramban has a few longer pieces but he doesn't really he doesn't usually drill down in the in the ramban alatira so you maybe in shara gamal that'll be uh, something for people to learn but that's not really a gateway i don't think to the rambam the kuzari the munis videas the ran really i think is because he really he really he sits at a crossroads in Hashkafically, but not just Hashkafically, also in the in the drushes. He has a lot of stuff which is very understandable to us. He explains Sukkim, he explains Gemaras, he has all kinds of discussions that are that are that are typical in Yeshiva, but he also regularly brings in the the philosophical lexicon and discussions of the Rishinim. And and that's a, I think a, a very good gateway to this kind of learning. I would say the Ran, the Ran really sits between the, it's, it's a cliche that the Ran sits between the Rambam and the Ramban. And he synthesized both their approaches. And not only is such a cliche, we even write that in the introduction that the, Ram, that the Ran synthesizes the Rambam and the Ramban. And it's true to a great extent as cliches often are useful. But I think that it's, it's a little too pat and to give a little more nuance to it, I would say the Ran, First off, the Ramban has a very important part of the Ramban's uh, approach and personality, I would say, is his Kabbalah. And you can't, you can't ignore that to, in, in, and understand what the Ramban really does. The Ran has no involvement in that. And not only has no involvement in that, in the, the Rivash and the Chuva, and the famous Chuva in Kufnan Zion, he, the Rivash quotes his Rabbi the Ran saying something against the Ramban's Kabbalah. So the Ran has no involvement in that. Now, He's not a, uh, he doesn't really follow the Rambam because even though he is involved in the philosophical pursuit and he uses those arguments and he accepts a lot of those assumptions, there's a lot of places where the Rambam goes several steps further in accepting what the what the philosophical approach is asserting, and the Ran stops a few steps before that, I think. And it comes up 
I think in a number of places, the Ron for uh, a, 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 an easy example would be the magic, the, 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 the sugya of magic is that the Rambam famously doesn't believe in it and, and shade him and others. And he didn't believe that these things existed. And the Ran very firmly does. And he says this a number of times in the drushes. He, he almost goes out of his way to make that point. And he brings the Rambam and he argues and he says, the Gemara says not like, and he brings all the Gemaras, several Gemaras that say that, 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 to show that they that the Gemara obviously did accept and obviously does exist. That's one example. Another example would be the Rambam believed that that Navua was a purely um, was was something that was a, a natural um, experience that a person could cleave to the the active intellect and ex, and ex, there, thereby experience Navua. Now the Ran accepts a lot of that assumption. He works with the active intellect. He understands Navua that way, but he also seems to think that it's like a cross between um, a nace and teva. And it's like, like the Sefer Ikram says, he says, it's like a, it's like a special, uh, a special grace or something that's granted to a person from a Kosh Baruch Hu, not a less naturalistic explanation for Navua. Those would just be examples I'd say. Um, so what was the question again? Were we asking, why was it just Ran specifically? Yes, that's where Okay, we so were. there's one more thing I would just say is the Ran, it's really, it's Munach B'Karen Zavis, and there's no good reason for it. There's a lot of bad reasons for it, but there's no good reason for it. He talks about things that we can understand. He talks about things that are important. He, it's an interesting read, and it's just difficult, it's just difficult to, to decipher, and that work needs to be done. So we, we worked on it for several years with a team, with a, a top, top-notch team with uh, Rip Schneier Burton and Rabbi J. David Bleich, who's uh, very famous in this field. Uh, and and the brand names at Art Scroll, and I think that somebody somebody expressed to me about the Joshua Ran. He said when he started learning it, he said just we was robbed. Like how could we not have? How did I not know about this when I was younger? Yeah. I think I think I'll throw in two, two comments. First of all, um, in another like Milo, so to speak. Or I'm not saying that you know versus other Rishonim is that it's written in Hebrew. I mean, I think you talk about this. He actually wrote it in Hebrew versus right. when you look at the other Rishonim, it's in Arabic. There's different translations. The old translations with Ibn Tibbins are really hard to read. Um, and the new translations, some of them are in Ivrit for America. They're just harder. And obviously, you have the English one. But saying that, interestingly, in the Ran, like I said, even before the article, we'll talk about the differences. Mossad of Cook has the Be'eris Maish edition, which is it was, there was even one with the Pirish, and people still weren't using it. You know, it, 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 maybe because I mean, I'm not, I don't know. We're just saying, you know, maybe because it's drushes, people thought it wasn't like systematic, even though it's something like that. I mean, I know, I think I different, but I mean, an analogy, I think there's a, the Akeda Sitzcha, the Akeda similar, does similar things a little bit later, and I know there's a book on that, it was just reprinted on his, uh, you know, philosophy, his thought by Sarah Heller Wolanski, I think her name is, I think she says in there, like, he, it, it's like a work of philosophy, but it's all over the Akeda, it's just an all, you know, she made a book, you know, distilling it and putting it into just bringing down his philosophy. Duran is not like that, but maybe that's something also why, so it's like drushes, and people are like, I don't know, scared of drushes. I don't know, something that's all well, but just endless. It's even with what Masar of Cook did, they gave a parish, but they didn't they didn't break it up into paragraphs with headers and and you know they didn't tame the forest really. They just gave you a parish if you would really put in the work. So it was a great help, but they didn't uh, you know they didn't do all the work. I, I could turn a question on you if I could ask you a question. Why in your shelfie? Uh, you have all the Svarim, you have Marnabuchim, you have Kuzari, you have Arashem, you have uh, Munasudeus, and there's no Josh Sharan. <laughs> I don't mean the art scroll one, but. So for, for listeners, you're talking about my shelfie that's on Twitter. That's right. Um, right. Sorry, I meant to explain okay, so that. I, yes, yeah, so I, I, I cultivated that shelf a while ago. Now I have a whole bookcase of like this Amuna Shkafa kind of thing, kind of farm. Um, I think the answer is actually, it's a good question. I think for some reason, even for myself, subconsciously, I went and I arranged, I put the drush on my drush shelf. So I have a whole shelf of specific mm. drush and that's where it went. Now really, those are just real drush sermons, but that, that's where it went. I think that's why it's not there. It's mm. a good question though. So... I, I think in another place, it's just it was missing from the historical record for some reason. I, I don't think they didn't have it, but it wasn't discussed for long periods. Uh, uh, just an example. So now Rabbi J. David Bleich has that safer with perfect faith. He has to, uh, on the Amunas and on, on the Ikrim. And he doesn't bring anything from the Drushes. And I asked him why he didn't have anything from the Drushes. And he says probably because there wasn't any translation handy, but it, it does it does belong there. We, we will, we will. I'm sure get to someone that makes extensive use of the drushes is the barber. No, but uh, I'm right. sure we'll, we'll get there. But let, let, let's take a step back for a second for listeners. Um, I mean, we, we mentioned it's it's Rabbi Nisim uh, Garandi, Rabbi Nisim from Garona, which is the Pirish I wrote to Pirish and the Riff. I mean, that's 
accepted now that that's who it is, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So who, who is the Drasha Saran? I mean, and if it's going to talk about Saran, maybe a little bit to give the listeners understanding, and we'll talk a little bit about the work. Okay. Uh, so before uh, the last 70, 80 years, let's say, there was there was some question about who, who wrote the Drasha Saran. There was even some suggestion that it was a Rab Nassim. It wasn't even necessarily a Rabbeinu Nisim. They didn't know who, uh, if, it, if the known even stood for Nisim. Uh, but it's pretty clear, for, certainly, that it was Nisim because uh, Abarbanel, who quotes him, like you said, Abarbanel quotes him dozens, if not hundreds of times. Uh, he even refers to him as Rabbeinu Nisim in a number of places. And even when they knew it was Rabbeinu Nisim, there was a theory that it was a Rabbeinu Nisim Talmud of the Ramban. There are a lot of problems with that. Even even something that should have been apparent a few hundred years ago would be obvious that um, the Ran, the, the Drushes, whoever the Bamakabra was, the Drushes uh, referred to the Ramban as Zatzal always. And according to the dates that they gave for this uh, Talmud of the Ramban, he wrote some of the Drushes while the Ramban should have, would, would have been alive unless it had been changed after. There's even some editions where he quotes the Ralbag. Uh, that's not in our edition, but in some of the editions, he even quotes the Rabag, so which obviously means that he couldn't have been, a, uh, you know, he had to have been later. Uh, couldn't have just been a Talmud or a Ramban. Uh, there's uh, another proof, which is that Rav Chazdai Kreskas, who was a Talmud of the Ran, in his Arashem, he quotes one thing from the Ran, and it's something that the Ran mentions a number of times, and he says his Rebbe, the Ran, he doesn't say his Rebbe, I'm sorry. He says the Ran was Mechadish, this idea about Moshe Rabbeinu's Nevoa. The Moshe Rabbeinu's Nevoa, well, maybe we'll talk about it later, but it was a nace. And, the, and he says that it was from Rabbeinu Nisim. Now, he doesn't say it was Moshe Rabbi Rabbeinu Nisim, but it's hard to imagine that it's a different Rabbeinu Nisim, and he doesn't specify that it wasn't Rabbeinu Nisim, his Rebbe, who was who was who loomed so large in the minds of the people in, in that generation. He was such a giant. I, I have something to say about that, uh, about how how much they looked up to him. Um, so that was already apparent, that probably that there was uh, that it wasn't the time of the Ramban. That it was probably the Ran. And also, uh, as we mentioned in the introduction, the Ran, the, whoever wrote the Drushes, mentions that there was some terrible plague that happened 13 years before. And it sounds like he's referring to the to the black pla- the black plague, uh, and that was in the 1300s and the thir- around 1350. So that obviously also wouldn't have been a time of the Ramban. Uh, it makes much more sense at the, the time of the Ran. Anyway, all this really could be all this speculation really could be put to rest uh, because we have this we have a parish altar from Yosef Saragossa, and he quotes n- a number of pieces from the Drushes, and in one of them he actually says Rabbeinu Nisan ben Ruvain. And in which case he's telling us exactly who it is. So there isn't really much uh, doubt about it. At this point, it's perfectly clear. I would also say that there's a lot of parallels. It's very interesting. There's a lot of parallels between what the Drusha says and what the Rana says in the Chedushim and the Rana on the Rif. So there's also, it, there's a lot to, to, to support that additionally. But it's, like I said, it's really clear. Right, those proofs were pointed out by the Feldman. I, I what was his name yeah. Feldman, who Rabbi published, Feldman, yeah. Yeah, he he. So he, interestingly, I'll just say it here already. He he published the critical edition based on the text, and now his is it was republished just that through uh, Mosnayim published that they have that, and then they his text with his basic notes footnotes was included in the Mosada of Kukon with their peerish in the bottom, and. Uh, and you, you, an art school used the you use that text as well, his text as well, right? Using the Seder of Cook, we there there were some changes, some some. Uh, well, we note when we make the changes, often by the suggestions of the Seder of Cook by Bears Meisha. But yeah, we use the text in Seder of Cook. Right. So he published the Zerus of Saragos from Xaviad, and he talks about that proof. As right. Well. Yeah. Um. He published okay. everything related to the Ran. He 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 published the Ran al Taira. He published uh, the Ran's Chuvas. He he did all the Ran. His his PhD. One of his dissertations is on the Ran. Right. Okay. So, so let's talk about so, so the whole the whole work as as a whole. We keep talking about his drushes surrounding. How many drushes are there? Do we know where he gave these drushes? Let's talk about the structure of the work before we get into more of the overall, you know, taking of the yeah, work. So it was known. It was interesting that it was known as the as the Yud Bey's drushes for a long time, uh, even though we actually have thirteen drushes. But if you notice in the numbers on the spine, it goes from one to five B, and then it goes from six to twelve. So it comes out to thirteen because there's two drushes of five. There's two versions of of drush five. Um, the uh, we don't I, I, we don't really know uh, what the what the presentation of these drushes was, it does seem clear that he delivered them to an audience. It wasn't, it wasn't just written. He is speaking. 
Uh, it seems clear from both the content and also he refers to the audience at times. He talks about how Hashav the audience is. He doesn't just mean as a general, anybody who's reading the Joshua Zaran must be Hashav. He's he's talking to an audience. So it's clearly he's, 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 he's delivering it to an audience. What audience could sit through three, four hours of Joshua's, which each one would be, I don't know. That I, I, We don't know the answer to that. Um, but it's uh, it's 13 Joshua's and a, a number of them relate to certain parashias. Uh, and one of them is on Shuva, seems to be Shabbos Shuva. Possibly he gave them in Shul on Shabbos. I, I don't know. So what's his overall, what's the overall style of the drushes? Uh It seems like he, he starts with, he starts with, often starts with Pesukim uh, that relate to either the Parsha or Haftarah or something that has to do with uh, probably that week that they were up to. And then he seems to have a number of things that he wants to discuss and he makes his way there. It's conversational, it flows, it meanders. Uh, you, There's something actually interesting, particularly about this work is that the Ron is not, is not producing, he's not making this product where he, where he, uh, it, was, it was perfectly crafted beforehand and he wanted to say it in a certain way and he went over it and he changed it. He, you you get to see his thought process. You see it unfolding. You see him saying Akasha, and then he says a Teretz, and then he says, "Well, there's another Kasha, and then we're forced to say something else." And you can see his thought at work, uh, which also makes it particularly fascinating, but it also makes it challenging because it's hard to it's really hard to follow the flow sometimes, and that's where we come in. Uh, which is what I was going to ask you. I mean, do you think he had an agenda when he when he wrote it? It's meaning meaning what what I mean by that is, of course, everyone does. But I mean, like in Munas Adayas, Reb going, you know, lays out exactly what he's doing. He's writing the safer for the Duran. Also, have there was more like like you said, was it just drushes that he, and we like you were just saying, we see his thought process as he's going through things. So, like I like I said before, I think that he, he we see the thought process unfolding, but also I do think that he has certain motifs that he wants to hit, and you see that from the fact that he hit it several times. Now he sometimes has. He seems not sure about certain ideas, and they, when they come up in different drushas, he says them differently even. Uh, like he says about Moshe's Navua, he explains it differently in different places. Something was clear to him, but not necessarily the explanation, or not necessarily every detail of the explanation was clear to him, and he presents it differently. But these were ideas that he wanted, I think, I think, it seems like there were certain ideas he wanted to express, and then he gets there in different ways, and then, by the way, he'll say other things. Uh, I don't know if it's because it was on his mind or it happened to come up naturally, organically, I don't know. So, I mean, let, let's talk about it a little bit. Obviously, it's a heavy, you know, very heavy work. Right. Um, and we're not going to do it justice in a podcast. But right. um, I think there are, we can bring out, I mean, you can explain to the listeners who are not familiar with Joshua Saran, who are, I want you a little bit more, you know, about the Sefer. I mean, is is it, do you want to talk about the Joshua about Maisha Rabbeinu, Maisha's Navua, or do you want to talk about it? I mean, another one, even another example, do you want to talk about a little bit, something that you want to bring out? Uh, so about Maisha's Navua. Uh, that's actually something that's in the first volume, so it's not so fresh in my mind. That he, uh, but this was this was something he says, like I said, in a, in a number of drushes, three, four, five, and five B. That Moshe's, and, and this is very important to the Ran, and, and he explains why it's so important. He says that like come Navi Oid doesn't mean that Moshe was simply the best Navi that ever could be. He says it it means that he was better than any Navi than a Navi should be able to be. Altogether, he does. It wasn't simply that Moshe excelled to the highest degree of a navi, and the Torah is telling us. And by the way, you should know that in the future, nobody's ever going to reach that level. The Ran says, if such a thing would be the pshat, then then the the Torah would almost would it would be as if the Torah was taking away our bechira. He says, for the Torah to tell us that in the future generations you're not going to reach Moshe's madrega, you're taking away my Bechira. Maybe I'll be Bechir to be like my Rabbeinu. Maybe I, maybe I will be like my Rabbeinu. Elamai, the Ran says, it means that Moshe was at a level that a person cannot be. It was only Baderach Nes that he could even reach such a level. And the reason why that's so important to the Ran is because that way, obviously, it's absurd for another Navi to come along and undermine the 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 uh, Moshe Rabbeinu in any way because Moshe wasn't simply the best Navi. He was a different a totally different Bria of a Navi, a Navi that, that was only B'derech Neis. So no other Navi obviously could reach that level if he, Moshe was only given the, the special chain that Kosh Baruch Hu allowed him to have, get to that level of Navua. Um, this brings up a question of Yudhi and Bechira, which is 
which is something we'd actually discuss in the in, in the notes and in in the, in, in the insight uh, because the about the, what the Ran saying that Akash Baruch Hu telling us that let's say the Pshat were not like the Ran and really he means the Torah means to say that no Navi would ever reach Moshe's Madrega, but not that it was Baderich Nes and simply telling us in the future you should know that nobody will ever reach that level that raises the question of the Diem Bechira and one Pshat would be. There are some who say that Meshachachma says, and some others say that uh, that the answer to Yedi Bechira is that that that, that Yedi Bechira is is there's no stira only when it's not expressed to mankind. If it's expressed to mankind, then there's a then then there actually is a contradiction between the Yedi and Bechira, and therefore the future can't be expressed to man that uh, what what the what the idea is. And according to that approach. It's impossible then for the Torah to say nobody's going to be able to reach the level of Moshe because then you will have a contradiction between Yedi and Bechira. Now, it happens to be the Ran doesn't seem to agree with that. The Ran in his parish al asks the question of Yedi and Bechira and he gives the answer that most, I think that would occur to most people, which is he just says that Akash Baruch Hu sees it and that in no way compels it. That's what he says. And he says he knows that a lot of philosophers have a problem with it, but he, seen, he, thinks, he thinks that that's the correct answer. Interestingly, and and so you already touched on. We'll get to this. What the what 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 you do in the new art school edition and your notes mm-hmm. and the insights. Those are two parts. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll discuss that more. So, I mean, mm-hmm. what other? I mean, you mentioned that was from the that's from the first volume. That's that's mm-hmm. the earlier drushes. What about the the new one that just came out in in the second volume? Are there any drushes in there that you want to touch on? Talk about? Yeah. Uh, so drush ten uh, has some very interesting, uh, and it's it's if we can call it comparatively relatively lighter than the other drushes. Uh, but there's some very, very beautiful and interesting ideas in there. Uh, he starts out by talking about, uh, it's about Parshas Ekev. And Moshe Rabbeinu is telling Klai Yisrael about when they're going to go into Eretz Yisrael. And they're going to be successful. And they should not say, And the Ran says, interestingly, he says that, um, that Akash Baruch, he's saying that he says that you should not say that um, he says Akash Baruch ki hu anasein lecha kayach lasis chayel. He doesn't say the pasuk doesn't say that Akash Baruch Hu gave you the success. The the concern is not that you're going to say that I achieved this for myself, but really the truth is that Akash Baruch Hu gave you the chayel, and you're taking credit for the chayel that Akash Baruch Hu gave you. Because he says, the Pasuk doesn't say, ki hu anasein lecha chayel. He says, ki hu anasein lecha kayach. Because of course it's true that a person is, that a person who's strong has, has the, has, has strength. And a person who's smart has, has intelligence. That's obvious. And it's not true that when the intelligent person does something intelligent. Akash Baruch Hu did the intelligent thing. This is the way the Ran understands it. I'm not saying everybody agrees with this. It's that, Hakash Baruch Hu gave you the kayach lasses chayel. He gave you the strength. He gave you the wisdom. He gave you the the ashiras. He gave you the the wisdom. Let's say to be kind to get the ashiras. But it, I think that's just an interesting uh, interesting look on the pasuk. The way I think we generally take it as Hakash Baruch Hu did the whole thing for me, which is not what the Ran is saying. The Ran is saying that Hakash Baruch Hu is not the proximate cause. He's the he gave you the kayach, and the kayach is the proximate cause. Hakash Baruch Hu is the is the behind the the kayach cause. Uh, then the Ran gets on. It could seem a little disjointed in the in the uh, notions of what the Ran is talking about, but they also often follow the flow of the psukim. And if you see the psukim, you'll see how how what the Ran says flows. But the Ran talks about what the point of um, the of einshim. He says an einish can't just be that 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 there's an intrinsic value to the einish. And Akash Baruch Hu, uh, somebody who does something evil, Akash Baruch Hu gives him a patch because you deserve the patch because there's something good about giving you the patch. He says nakama. The Torah says you not to take Nakama. The Torah says that Nakama is a bad thing. So it can't be that Akash Baruch Hu likes to take Nakama. It's not Nakama. It must be that there's some that there's some utilitarian reason for giving an Einish. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because it's an intrinsic value. Maybe you do deserve it. But this, but it's not a good thing for Akash Baruch Hu to dish it out because of because of like we see the Torah doesn't allow somebody to take Nakama. He says the reason for Einshim really is to fix a person's behavior, uh, is for other people around them to see that doing uh, doing evil leads to uh, leads to tsaras. And and that's the only that Akash Baruch Hu uh, is Ma'anish people like a uh, like a father strikes a son, which is he doesn't do it out of Nakama. He doesn't do it because 
because it's something intrinsically valuable. He wants to he wants to teach the child. He wants to educate him. So then the Ran asks, and we can see him asking. He asks, why then are there Einshim in the next world? There's no improvement in the next world. The world you you don't then go on to do mitzvahs, and nobody else is around to see it, so it doesn't improve anyone. So he says the reason for Einshim in the next world is because there's an is because is it's not actually an Einish either. He says Einshim in the next world, quote unquote Einshim, is the natural outcome of doing the averas. If you if you're if you if you damage your neshama in this world, so then in the next world you're going to suffer. That's just a it's a, a person is going to suffer. That's just a natural outcome. It's not an Einish. Um, which uh, I think there's also very interesting ideas. Um, and then he also adds, he says that that's only for, he says that's for Einstein um, that will last forever because an Einish that will last forever is is not accomplishing anything. But he says an Einish, which is just, let's say for 12 months or whatever the amount of time is, that uh, purifies the soul. So that also has a constructive purpose for doing, for, for Akash Baruch carrying out the Einish. Uh, this leads to a discussion about Yisurin, Yisurin Shalava. And the Ran says that Yisurin Shalava can only, I'm really skipping over a lot. <laughs> there's, there's a lot that in, in the middle over here, but just to you know, get to the, the points that I can express easily. Uh, the Ran asks, he says, uh, he, he, he addresses the question of Yisurin Shalava. And uh, he says that it must be that one of the questions he asks, and something I skipped over, he says that why when Moshe is chazering over the Einshim that were delivered to Klai Yisrael in the Midbar, does he say about Dasan and Aviram being destroyed? And it doesn't mention Kairach. And he doesn't say Kairach, who was the principal instigator of that incident. So he says that uh, because Dasan and Aviram were wiped out together with their children. Now, okay, so what's the, what's, what does that, what does that matter? He says that a person it starts really, there's, there's a lot of different threads. It starts out with Moshe saying that it's easy for a person, he, he, he implies that to, to reach Ava and Yir of Hashem is something that's really accessible to people. And the question is, how is it accessible? How is it an easy thing? He says, what is Akash Baruch asking you just to fear him and to love him? What's the big deal? I, but it's very difficult. That's the kasha that everybody asks. And the Ran says that a person has, he has his intellect, he has his seichel, and he has his dimyon. And he's constantly torn between the forces of his seichel and his dimyon. And the Dimyan says, embrace this world and, 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 and enjoy yourself and follow your taivas. And the Seichel cleaves Hakash Baruch And the Ran has extensive ex- uh, uh, elaboration on why the Seichel and Dimyan work this way. And he even says that he's being Makatsar on, on what he could say about it. But the idea is that the Dimyan pulls into this world with all the things that he could um, enjoy. But when a person suffers in this world, that, that, that shakes him out of his out of his uh, placidness, out of his um, out of his dream like stake in the world, and it 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 awakens and and, and bolsters the seichel. And since Yisurin accomplished this, so Moshe says to Klal Yisrael, Dust and Avirim were destroyed. They didn't even have children to leave their possessions to. That should t- that should shake you out of out of any connection to Elam Hazat to, 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 for your, for your Dimian to, to lead you along this path that you should, that you're going to say, well, I'm going to leave my possessions to my children and I'm going to, uh, at least there's, there's something that I'm going to be able to leave in this world. When you look at Dasan Aviram and they left nothing, that's the greatest way of shaking you out of your dreamlike, dreamlike state in this world. So, that's what Yisur and Shalava are about. Yisur and Shalava are to enable someone to reach a higher level through shaking him out from under the influence of his dimyon. And he says, it can't be, this is to be, I guess this will catch people's interest more. Uh, he says, why, what's so special about Yisurin in this world? He says, don't tell me. Now, everybody would say, what's the reaction? Why, what's the point of Yisurin in this world? Because it takes care of our Einshim and Olam Haba. That's, that's, that's the Pashup Shat. That's what uh, plenty and plenty say that. Every Shainim would say that. And the Gemara doesn't sound like that. The Ran says that can't be the reason. It can't be that we have Einshim in this world, take care of Einshim in the next world. He says, a simple Cheshvin. He says, if you deserve uh, seven units of punishment for your Avera, so then whether it's in this world or whether it's in the next world, it's the same amount of suffering. So if one second in the next world is like seven years of suffering in this world, so then in order to take off one second of suffering in the next world, you have to suffer the seven years in this world. 
You don't get off easier because it's in this world. That's not, that's not din. That's not mishpat. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does everything exactly according to mishpat. And that's not mishpat. So in this world, the suffering has to equal the suffering in the next world. So it says it can't be that we're shaving off Anjim in the next world. And if anything, you would ask someone, say, let me have it in the next world. I'd much rather have it in the next world because I'd rather just push it off to as late as possible. Unless it's easier in this world, there's nothing better about it. And he says, the reason why we have it is not because we're taking care of Anjim in the next world. It's because it's supposed to help you in this world to get to something. So in the insights, we talk about, we give the other Pshatim in Yisur and Shalava, and we connect it to... Uh, the Ran says a lot of things based on this idea and you search lava, but I'm not sure. I don't know if this is already, uh, uh, you know, too far from whatever the question was, if there was a question. No, no, it was just to talk about examples. I mean, that's very, very okay. interesting. Like you said, it's different than what, what people would think. So, right. Um, those are some it connects to UTS and Shime. Sorry if I could just you know talk about it differently from what people would think. But he says about UTS and Shime, this is something that we do in the insights because he doesn't mention this in the drushes, but in his parish Alatira, he says, because of Yusur and Shalava, he explains that. Uh, the reason for yes, the the reason for Gullah's Mitzrayim, he says Gullah's Mitzrayim. He says is not he doesn't say this. But he, he he's he's not saying it's because it's an Avera. It's not because Avram did anything wrong. It's not to be masakin anything. He says Avram asked Bama Eda, why did Avram ask Bama Eda that they're going to inherit the land, and he didn't say Bama Eda I'm going to have children. So this connects to Drush too. When Akash Baruch Hu gives you a promise for good, it's not going to be, it's, it's, it's going to be fulfilled regardless. So a promise that Akash Baruch Hu said to Avram, you're going to have children. Uh, that was a promise for good. And it was definitely going to be Mekoyim. But, but the promise that they're going to inherit the land is a promise for good for Avram's children. But it's a promise for bad for the people who are currently living there because they're not going to be able to live there anymore. So that's a, a haftacha from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which incorporates good and bad, that's not a haftacha that will necessarily be fulfilled if it's not deserved. So therefore, Avram asked, how do I know that they're going to deserve the land? And HaKadosh Baruch Hu answers him, they're going to have Gals Mitzrayim. What does that mean, Gals Mitzrayim? They're going to suffer, and they're going to daven, and they're going to turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and they're not going to be misled by their dimyon. That's what the Ran says. And that's the reason for Gals Mitzrayim. And that's, the, that's not the reason for Gals Mitzrayim. That's the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu's answer to Avram, but Ma'eda was Gals Mitzrayim. So I, I actually think it's good. You've already answered. Well, I was going to ask you what the insights do. Now, now we're ready okay. to see what the insights do. They bring in other things, either just differences from what he says or bringing in what he says in other places, you know, right. that he doesn't say in the Okay. I mean, I have a question here that I don't like the question, but I'm going to ask the question. What's right. the most you say this thing, uh, part thing in here? Obviously, that's an impossible question. What does that mean to you, to him, to who? What does this mean? Right. What's the most important, you know, so to speak, for the, you know, thing? I don't know. So it could be taken however you want. Is it to you? Is it something that you found interesting? Is it something that you think is that it's overarching theme that he goes with again and again? I mean, answer it how you want. But yeah, I guess the uh, uh, they would be like you're saying, like you're saying, different perspectives. I would say uh, <clears throat> at least three perspectives on it would be what does what does the oilum think the most sadistic. Uh, part of the drushes is what does the ron think the most sadistic part is and what do i personally think the most sadistic part is so the island seems to think i don't know if this is they think this is the most sadistic part is the only part that they know but the one that's most often quoted is what he says about elu velu even though he doesn't actually i don't think he actually uses the words elu velu anywhere but his explanation about and it's quoted in the, the excise quotes in his akdama and that's why it's that's probably why it's widely known uh, that the Ran says that uh, he's trying to figure out why how you could say that everything was given to Moshe both the the true the both the the the, the true psak and the not true psak and he says that Akash Baruch Hu says that you should follow what the Chachamim decide what the Rav decides or however whatever the Klali apsak are you should follow the Klali apsak and that's what Akash Baruch Hu wants you to do and that's it. And even though that's not the objective truth he holds, you could you could think that there isn't any objective truth. But the Ron, the Ron thinks that there is an objective truth to what the Torah meant, and it wasn't just left open for the Chum to decide. But even though there's an objective truth, Hakadosh Baruch Hu said, "I want you to figure it out according to the way humans use their intellect and figure it out." And and that's why the Psak is correct, and that's why you should follow what the Psak is. That happens to connect, you know, everything connects. Maybe I'm sounding a little like the, you know, in, in, in like a drush, but this connects. The Ron asks, uh, if if mitzvahs have an intrinsic worth to them beyond just what Akash Baruch Hu is telling us to do, then then why is following the psak not going to lead to a bad result? Which I mean, there are two different ways of looking at mitzvahs. Mitzvahs could be that we follow what Akash Baruch Hu says, and there's not an intrinsic 
value to the action. It's just like Gosh Baruch Hu says, I want you to do this thing. And following what Gosh Baruch Hu says is itself valuable. He says, I want you to jump up and down. So that's itself valuable, but not the jumping up and down is actually valuable. Or Gosh Baruch Hu picks the things that are themselves intrinsically valuable. And this is something that's discussed by the Rambam and the Ramban. And many others talk about it. And the Ran holds like the Rambam and the Ramban that the, in the mitzvahs have intrinsic value. So he says, if they're, when they say they have intrinsic value, it means that doing a mitzvah is beneficial and doing an Avera is harmful. So then when the Bezdin paskins, something that's really usher should be mutter, then I'm doing something that's intrinsically harmful. So what protects me from that? And to that one, the Ron gives several answers. One answer he says is that it's so important to follow what the Sanhedrin says that even though there might be some damage suffered thereby, it's it, it overrides the... Uh, there's, it's of overriding value to follow what the Sanhedrin says. Okay, I'm sorry. That was that was the most sadistic thing I think according to the Ilum. And the Ran, the only way I could figure out what he finds most sadistic is what he repeats. I would say the fact that he says this about Moshe Rabbeinu is Nabu, I would think just from the fact he says it so many times and he says that the whole Torah rely depends on it that the Torah can't be overturned in any way. Uh, and for me personally, uh, I, I would need more clarity in this. But his his he has scattered comments about Ashkach Pratis that if I could if I could really figure it out and unify it in some some unified theory uh that would be the most sick uh if i uh you know if i can come up with that one more example you can mention is the, from Josh dollar i mean because you mentioned it at the beginning so i'll go back to it maybe people find it interesting where he talks about sorcery and magic and talking about the over there and, and mm-hmm. actually a big part of the Josh talking about Shabinu, the same theme but he talks he's busy at the end with sorcery magic when I mean, he says it's real I mean, you want to talk maybe a little bit what he says over there just because people might find it interesting <clears throat> Uh, so he talks about Dark and Myri, uh in in just four and just twelve, <clears throat> and it's uh, just about what the, the Gemara says that anything that's that's Mishum Rufua is not Mishum Dark and Myri, and the Rambam says that it means anything that there are different ways of interpreting the Rambam, but the Rambam says something like anything that is scientifically sound is Mishim Rafua and is not Mishim and has no problem with Dark Myri, to which the Rishayim ask and the Ran at length, he asks um, that there's a number of Gemaras over there about Dark Myri and Shabbos that that uh, that 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 say the Dhamma Roim told people to do all kinds of uh, practices that do not seem to be scientifically sound, in which case, obviously, then it's not simply about science, the Ran holds. So he disagrees with the Rambam and he says that it's it's about things that are not kishof in the sense that he says, uh, let, me, let me take a step back, sorry, that, that science is not simply what we're able to, to detect, that since there's a system that at work that's not simply a scientific system that's detectable, there's Derek Seguli, as he says, is that uh, the way they understood magnets? He says he, 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 he. I'm not sure if he he gives the example of magnets. The Rajma gives the example of magnets um, that they it works in a way that we can't explain, but it, it but it obviously works. So it's not about uh, being scientifically sound. It's about uh, that the that the system um, is 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 a, is a is a like a preordained system of 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 nature. That it's whether it's scientific or whether it's Derek Seguli. Either way, it's, that's not Dark Amiri. But what we're discouraging is using Malachi Chavala with uh, Kishof, things that are um, that are the occult. Exactly how to define that is you can see in the insights, and we discussed that exactly how to define that. Um, before we get, we'll get we'll get into the translation, all that work. Before before that, one other thing that I think pertains to this is, I mean. Where does the Ran fall? I mean, you kind of mentioned this Ramban and the Ran, but where does he fall in? I mean, I mean, like you said, it should be on that shelf, anyone's shelf of like you say the sickest farm or the return him with the Munas the Deus and the Kuzari and the, I don't know, Munarama and the Dekrim and the Arashem and whatever, all, all those farm. I mean, because uh where exactly does the does does he does he fall in? I mean, we're in Nebuchim, obviously Ramban. Where where does he fall? How is he similar, dissimilar? So, like I said earlier, I, I said he, we, we say he's between the Rambam and Ramban. I would say that he falls between Rambam and not Rambam. And it's interesting because he actually almost chronologically falls that way because the Ar Hashem, written by his Talmud, Ruchaz Dei Kreskas, really sought to supplant the Mar with his with his totally different system of, of Ar Hashem, which isn't really, I don't think it really has such a precedence in, um, in Dresh Saran. But the Ran, like I said, he accepts a lot, a lot of the Rambam, um, but, but with a more, let's call it traditionalist stance, uh, slant 
um, of, of not going as far as the Rambam and, and really tempering, I would say. He tempers a lot of the Rambam's uh, um, philosophies. So uh, I would say, I'd say you know, like I say, he falls between Rambam and anti-Rambam. Uh, I think he straddles that. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, about the work. I mean, what what was it like? Your work was translating, putting foot on. I mean, talk about what was the work like, and what did you do in the translation and the and the the notes on the bottom of the page? So we obviously we turned into English, but I don't I don't really see my work so much as a translator because so much of so much of what I do is not about translation. Uh, that's probably in most of what art school does. It's <clears throat> it's not about the language. It's really about the pshat. And it's we happen to be expressing it in in English, but uh, like uh, some of their other works, they've done in English and then they turn them into Hebrew, because they're valuable works regardless of the language. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that you said about the uh, you know that this is in Hebrew, but you see from the fact that the Rishonim all wrote in the language of this of of the Hamenam, and and the, the Rambam even writes in some of his letters, he 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 says he wants the Hamenam to read it, that they wrote in Judeo Arabic, and in the Ran's time. I don't know exactly what their language was. He spoke, but he did it in Hebrew. But the idea is we're, put, we're putting in English. These works were meant for people to see. They weren't meant to be set off for the elites, like like we see that Dari wrote in a language that everybody understood. So we're writing in English. That, that's really the intention is for people to be able to read it, for everyone to be able to read it. Um, but the work that we're doing is is just trying to make, just trying to figure out what's, what's being said, obviously, to start. And in the Ran specifically, uh, I think we're taming it a little bit. We are we're 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 splitting up into into recognizable paragraphs. We're giving headers to explain what's being what's being what's about to be said, what is being said. Uh, in 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 my work, I don't know if all art school works are exactly like this, but I try to make the text somewhat self-contained in that the text makes sense on its own, and the notes really expand on that. Uh, I put in a lot of elucidated text just so that it reads, and there's it it, it shouldn't. You shouldn't take recourse. Uh, you shouldn't need to 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 look at the notes just to understand what's going on. But the notes really expand on what the Ran is saying, and we compare it with what what his contemporary said, what his predecessor said, what those who followed him said. Because, like I said, the Ran really sat between the Rambam and the next generation. Really, all all flowed from the Ran. It's very interesting in, in the Sefer Machshava after Marnavuchim. So there was Ramban, but pretty much there was nothing until the Ran. And then there was the explosion. There was Reb Chazai Kresen with the Arashem, and there's the Sefer Ikrim, and there's the Rajbats. So all of them, were, they were really following in the Ran's footsteps, and the Ran really restarted this. Uh, but so we're, we're trying to tie these things together. And the insights, we give broader views. Uh, when he brings up these Yusaitistic uh, ideas about Yusur and Shalava, so we think that it should discuss all kinds of views. And the Ran himself mentions the Ramban, but he says he doesn't want to burden the reader. So I'm not so inclined and I'm not worried about burdening the reader. So we, we did write about it. Right, with the Rashbats, you mean there's the, the Tashbats and there's no Rashbats yeah. Chuvas and he wrote Maganovis is his work on right. uh, on this. And then obviously later on, a hundred or so years later, you had the Barbanel and right. Right. Yitzchuk, right. Yitzchuk, 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 both discuss a lot of these same similar type themes. And I'm sure the others are forgetting as well. So, I mean, you mentioned here that you, you're obviously translating for, for the Hamayin Am, so to speak. But, I mean, who is the intended audience? Obviously, the intended audience now is successful in English for everybody. But I, I guess, I mean, who, who do you envision it, someone picking it up and using it? Is anybody can just pick it up and, and just use it? And is not only can they, I mean, is it suggested? I mean, that's kind of what you were alluding to earlier. So... <clears throat> Uh, it's not easy reading. I think that should be obvious. Um, certainly, if you're still listening to this podcast at this point, I think it should be obvious that it's not easy. Um, it requires work. We try to help the reader as much as possible, but we faithful to the run. And, and if you're going to be if you're faithful to the run, and if you're going to be faithful to the run, then then it's going to be difficult. And it's not. You can't make it too easy. It's impossible. But I think with work, I think. Uh, a, a bismedrish uh, boy who's interested in thing. I think that with work to do it, get success. Be a very precocious uh, senior high schooler. But other than that, I think adults who 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 are engaged in in any kind of intellectual pursuits, I think they should be. I think they should be able to gain from it. And like I said, I think this is a great gateway to this kind of thought. I think that. If you're interested in these kinds of things, you can't open it. People are interested. They open a Marna Vuchim and they read the introduction. They don't know what's going on and they close it and they never open it again. But I think that this really is, really could open 
the world to them of, of the Rishayim and the Rishayim Svarad, Machshava. Right, absolutely, and I, and I, I think I'll, I'll go back to what, what I was saying. I mean, and I've, I've, I've gone through a couple of drushes, but not two years ago, um, is that the um, the fact that it's written in Hebrew, even now it's the English one, but when you're reading the Hebrew, the Hebrew itself is accessible. So then you read, you read obviously you can have the translation if you want to use the art school, yeah. but, but, but your your work, but um, besides for the notes and the insights, which are very helpful, but you know, as opposed to when you open the other's farm, you're, you're, it's hard, you're breaking your teeth on some translation and it's not what they wrote, it's not their words exactly. So even that alone is, is different. Um, I mean, what was, obviously this has come up and, you know, again and again in, in what we've been discussing, but I mean, what do you think uh, can be learned, you know, gained from someone from learning the Drush Saran? Why would you tell someone who could pick it up? But general, someone's going to pick it up. What can be learned actually from the Drush Saran? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it might it might open their minds to to questions that they never thought of. It might give them answers that they never thought of, and and it it gives it can give them perspectives on gemaras and psukim and concepts that they 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 never really thought about, and and they were. They were important to the run. It, we're we're really transported to his world. We really see, like, from his repetition, from the things that he focused on, we're transported to what did the Rishonim think was important and Navua. I don't think we talk so much about Navua. The run was very focused on Navua and what a Navi could do, what a Navi can't do, what's involved in being a Navi, what the requirements of being a Navi. And the, the Rambam was famously into into Navua and thinking about it, and they they contemplated it. it. Was it was it was real to them? To us, it's almost uh, to some. If you don't think about it, it, could just be some historical artifact that there was Navua in Klal Yisrael. And this was this was so basic to their to their every thought. That's just an example. Uh, the you could also see in the run. I think. I think it's particularly interesting with the Ran people who are learning yeshivas, and the Ran is 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 the uh, Ish Halacha. He's uh, you know he's everything on the Gemara, and he has everything on the Riff, and he's and he's so and he's so clear, and he's so um, is so focused. But to see another side of him, there's a, there's a there's such a personal side to him in the drushes. He speaks in that drush I was talking about the Yisurin Shalava, and and he connected it to the to the Black Plague, and he's talking to a zebra that was ravaged by the Black Plague, and he says to them, we should we should take a lesson from this. And then he says, and he was just talking about how it's the etzbel Kim, and the etzbel Kim is only, it's a punishment and it's, it's, in, it's, it's in connection to chait. And then he says, such a surprising thing. And I wonder if there's something comparable in rabbinic literature to this. He said, I'm not saying that the people who died did any averis. I'm just telling you that this is what happened. It's such, an, such, a, such a surprising step back he was he's he's talking to the tzibur and trying to tell him how connected the averis are to the to the einish and then when he finally works his way up to saying how there was this einish he steps back and says i'm not saying that the people who died or i'm not saying that the sufferers were in any way responsible for this i just know that it happened i don't know i don't know more than that i just know that it happened and i know that that akash baruch Hu's maisim are are to to improve us and they're connected to what's being done in this world. But I'm not, you know, I I'm not gonna. I don't have my crystal ball and I don't have Navu and I don't, I'm not telling you that Pliny who died was uh, did anything wrong. Anyway, that's just uh, like I was saying. It's just another perspective on the Ran. And I think uh, uh, to add another thing, the Ran, like I said, there are parallel conversations that he has in the drushes to what he writes in his Chedushim and his Chedushim on Chulin, where he talks about Nichosh. And he explains the, the Gemara that talks about Eliezer and Yonason Ben Shol about their Nichosh. And there's a lot of different ways to learn that Gemara, whether what they did was the was an Isra of Nichosh or not. And the Ran is Chadushim explains why it, why it wasn't. And he says because uh, because what they did was actually logical. It had there was a logical reason why Eliezer's test was going to uh, prove what he needed, and it wasn't just Nichosh of relying on some occult sign. And the uh, and 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 Yonason was also. And then in his drushes, he goes through all that same shot, and then he adds on a whole philosophical explanation for why Yonason's test was a good test and about bravery and uh, aggression and the humors and how it uh, how that develops in a person. And it's so interesting because when you read the Ran in Chulin, he says what he says, and then he's done. And you don't know that he has that whole idea behind it that he just didn't tell you. You didn't know that he had this whole scientific, philosophical understanding of it, and he just doesn't say it. He just doesn't share it with you. And the drushes, he says it. So he's just he's just giving us 
more so what, what's missing from what the, what he wrote in other places it's just so interesting fascinating and 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 like you said in the notes and this is cross reference so you, so now which is really nice and like you mentioned the Masada of cook editions are nice but it doesn't uh, do a lot of this which is you cross reference and you bring down that on the in the notes there's insights that discuss this as well and if there's two volumes i'll put the link in the in the, in the show's notes and it, it's really nice that there's now available in English a one of the real Sifra Yisoyed of the Rishonim, and you know not one of the was not available in any translation really before, and it wasn't one that's like you said it should be well known, but it's not necessarily unfortunately isn't necessarily the most well known of these type of svarim. Like I interrupt just in what, in what we did. Somebody in our school suggested actually that we turn this into Hebrew because I, if you go through it, you'll see the treatment is uh, you know we we put a lot of work into it and we really bring a lot into the text so it like i said it's not about the english it, it would be valuable even hebrew but you know there is a masada cook edition right 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 so um okay so that's really bad bad to josh and saran and we're really we're at the end of the show i just want to ask you uh, one thing i know you this is not your first uh, project actually you actually did something else but i don't know if it's so much uh, you know it's similar type of stuff real muster i guess nevardic type stuff you did uh from uh, Rabbi Per, right? Madrigus Adam in English, two two volumes. I don't know. Maybe talk a little bit about about that. Tell the listeners a little bit that with the yeah. other thing. Uh, yeah. Did. So Rabbi Yechiel Per is Rashiva and Yeshiva Farakoi. He's married to an enical of uh, of the Alter Nevardic, and he's very uh, he's 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 the prime expositor of uh, of Nevardic Musar in, uh, in, in today's uh, generation, I think. And he gives Musar Adam uh, regularly, and he has many many hours of tapes, and uh, he's been he's done all different parts of the Madrigas Adam and I turned some I turned uh two two uh seasons worth we can call that um into books there's one called Mind of a Man which is about Bear Amidas from Madrigas Adam and the second one is called Faith of Rafir uh they're both with Israel Bookshop Faith of Rafir is on the Shar Bitachan of the Madrigas Adam which is maybe the more well-known part of Madrigas Adam is, is his, his unique ideas about Bitachan and it's through the lens of a of, of Rabbi Per, who's who's an American, but connected to the to that uh, to that um, Messiah of of Musser, and he's a Talmud of Rabbaron, and so it's uh, I think uh, I think those are very valuable. Uh, he's very valuable insights. Very interesting. Okay, um, and uh, like I said, I'll put a link to the Joshua Saran to both volumes that so people can purchase it. And thank you once again for joining me. Okay, thank you. Another uh, very important and interesting drush is drush 11, the longest of the drushes, in, in which the Ran sets forth his view of mishpat and the role it's supposed to play in society. The Ran discusses, he says, how all societies require some system of jurisprudence as a means of maintaining the society, keeping it peaceful, preventing anarchy. The terrorist system of mishpat was also intended to accomplish this uh, harm, harmonious society, but the Ran says that that's not that's not actually the primary goal of the Tarz Mishpat, <clears throat> in which case the society is not perfectly maintained through the Tarz Mishpat. Sounds very surprising. He says the primary purpose of the Tarz Mishpat is just like all other mitzvahs of the Torah. It's applying the Torah's, he says that with regard to Mishpat, the Torah's intrinsically true and perfect system of Mishpat is supposed to serve, as all other mitzvahs, as a conduit for the Shefah Eliki, for Klal Yisrael. Aran says that's the reason why the Sanhedrin is, which is the pinnacle of Mishpat in the in in the nation, was where were they seated? They were seated in the Lishkas Agazis by the Beis Hamikdash, just like the Beis Hamikdash and the Avodah is performed inside. That was were all conduits for the Shefah Eliki, and very obviously so. The same is true for the Mishpat handed down by the Sanhedrin, which is less obviously so. But since the Torah's Mishpat has an intrinsic value, but it was not specifically geared towards maintaining society. So therefore, the Torah provides the king with extra statutory authority to apply the law in cases where if there's a breakdown in society, the Torah's mishpat doesn't prevent it. And if there's rampant crime, which the Torah's mishpat for whatever reason is not preventing, <clears throat> the king is authorized and bidden to step in and uh, and address that. The Ran says that this is actually, uh, he thinks that this explains Klai Yisrael's chait in requesting a king. Shmuel became angry at them, even though there's a tzad that it's a mitzvah to appoint a king. And the Ran says that this was because their motivation in asking for a king 
is that they're, they didn't have a proper appreciation for the intrinsic value of the Dine Terra that Shmuel was handing down, and they wanted to be governed only by the extra statutory law of the king. So they wanted a king uh, instead of Shmuel, really. Uh, the Ran is not the only one who's, who, who makes this point, who, who takes this perspective. The Rambam has cases, various cases in which the Bezdin and the king applied dinim that are beyond the letter of the law. And the Rajba says that the world couldn't exist if we have simply an exact application of Dine Taira. Uh, but the Ran goes further than the Rambam and Rajba, seemingly in that he, he, he applies it in a more sweeping way, with more sweeping statements about how the Dine Taira weren't really... Uh, geared towards producing a perfect society, a harmonious society, and the Torah therefore wanted the king to step in. The Rambam and the Rajba sound more like it's an ad hoc emergency measure, and the Ran sounds like more that it was built into the system at the start. Uh, the Rajba actually supports this uh, this this view that the that the Dine Torah can't be applied precisely, and the and the, the world would be destroyed, would 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 fall to corruption and deteriorate if just the Dine Torah were applied from uh, Gemara and Bama where it says that the Khurban came because the people only followed the letter of the law. Which is interesting because this is actually it's actually very difficult uh, raya that the Raj is bringing in his Shuva because the Gemara is talking about li- going with Nimishur Sadin. And he says that we need to go with Nimishur Sadin. And the reason why there was a Khurban is because people only followed the strict letter of the law and they didn't go with Nimishur Sadin, which doesn't really seem to relate to what the Raj was talking about, which is going beyond the Dine Terra and applying in applying uh, punishments in cases where it's not called for. But anyway, <clears throat> regardless, uh, uh, one final point I would like to make is uh, something we discussed in the insight, which is makes it very uh, contemporary and applicable, what this Ryan is talking about over here, is in the 1930s, there was a British committee, it was called the Peel Commission. They were investigating the possibility of self-governance for the Jews in, in living in Israel, Palestine at the time. And Chief Rabbi Herzog wrote to Reb Chaim Eiser, to ask how for details and, and guidance in applying Dine Tyre in a modern state. And Rip Herzog's intention was that we were going to follow Chaishemish, but the Tyra exactly according to Dine Tyra. I don't know exactly what he what his question was, how to apply it, but he his vision was to apply Chaishemish. And Rukhai Moiser responds, interestingly, to by pointing to this Josh Saran. And he says the Ran says society requires extra statutory law, otherwise it can't function. Reb Chaim Moser says, if a Ganev can get away with stealing, if he steals and he senses that he's going to be caught, so then he just has to go into Besdin and admit, and he won't suffer any consequences. He simply has to return the stolen object, but he won't suffer any punishment. And Reb Chaim Moser says that's just unworkable in running a country. Reb Chaim Moser says the Nesivas in his parish al say says the same thing. Reb Chaim Moser also has a tshuva to Rebbe Hanan where he makes the same point. Uh, but... Anyway, so that was just uh, the uh, Rabbi Moses applying it in a very practical way, applying this uh, Joshua Saran.